One and a half hour class. It will not be too long. I will just, uh, I want to give you examples in class on the computer. So it will be more like a relaxing class. Okay. Um, yes. Will we have second midterm? Yeah, of course. When do you want to have it? In two weeks? Yeah. Okay, so I, I will put this also on the web and email you, okay? Should be something in two weeks. Or so. Okay. So, what I want to do today is um, remember we had an example on the multi input, multi output case. And I gave you uh, an example that looked like this. We had an example. And the example looked like that. 0, 1, minus 2, minus 1. x plus 0, 1, 2, 1, u. And so it's um, find k matrix for roots at x equals minus 1 and minus 2. So that was a problem. And we found for this two sets of solutions. Solution for that was two sets of solutions. K1 was 2 minus 1, 0, 0. And we had another set of solution, K2 is equal to minus 1.5, minus 0 0.5, 0 minus 1. And these were just two solutions. And in fact, we could find many others. Right? We could find many solutions that would satisfy this. So there was no unique solution, basically. That was the issue here. No unique solution. Unique solution. Okay, now was the issue. There was no unique solution for this problem. We had two routes to set. However, we couldn't find a unique feedback gain K. We had a lot of K matrices, okay, that would satisfy this condition. And why was that? The reason was we had two states and two controls. Okay, and it was not a unique problem anymore. We had a lot of solutions. Okay, now is this a bad thing? No, of course not. We have a lot of solutions. We can choose now whichever we want to satisfy this, this problem. <coughs> so, why is one better than the other? So that was kind of the question, right? Why, was, why is one better than the other? Well, um, we, at that time we made the, the comments that maybe you don't want to use one of the controls or you want to use the other control more than the other or you want to, or maybe your measurement in one of the states is not reliable and you want to uh, have a larger feedback on the other one and things like that right so I said that we can now choose we should be able to choose one or the other and when I say when I have this problem that looks like this x plus b u and then you have the x and you feed it back with k plus minus. Now, as I said, you might say, well, one of the controls is more important than the other one or one of the states is more important than the other one because I have two states and two controls so I can choose, right? I can choose between those states or between those controls. So. If I choose one or the other, that means I can do some sort of an optimization saying that this is more important, maybe I should be using this, you know, that kind of thing. So that leads to a problem that we use. Um, there's a large world of 
optimal control. Okay? In optimal control, we don't really set set desired eigenvalues. Desired eigen values. We don't do that anymore. Okay, we don't set eigenvalues anymore. I mean, here in this problem, we said find k, the k matrix for this set of eigenvalues. Well, we don't do that anymore. Instead, we are looking for some sort of an optimization. Because another issue we, we have been talking about is real and imaginary. Uh, we say, well, let's say the open loop eigenvalues are somewhere here. Okay? And then we move the them as a closed loop eigenvalue, we move them here. So the question is always, why are we not moving them over here? I mean, isn't it better to move it far away in the real axis so that the response becomes very quickly to where it's supposed to go, right? I mean, if I give a step input, the response, you know, might look like this. Why not make sure that the response goes immediately like that, right? Why not move these two eigenvalues all the way over here? The desired eigenvalues. Why not here? What was the reason we don't want to move it too far that way? Remember why that was? Because if you want to move it too far that way, then this K matrix will become a large number. If it becomes a large number, then you multiply this with a large number. And if there's an error here, it will be a problem, right? So you, you will multiply the error with a large number. So you, so, or you might not have infinite controls. That's another thing. You might not have infinite controls. Uh, from a linear system point of view, you can put it very far away. And K, the K matrix can have very large numbers. It can have millions, right? And then you multiply this with millions and you will become, again, millions. And because it's a linear system, it will work, but it will not work in real life because this, is, this has a limited value. For example, in the elevator, right, you have, let's say, plus minus 30 degrees over here, okay? So how, can it, how would it be possible to make this a very large number if you multiply this with this, and this is not 30, but it is 50 suddenly, right? So, so you can't really move it too far this way. So you have to stay somewhere here so that this U doesn't become very large, okay? And this x, even if there's an error, you might have still a, a reasonable feedback. Otherwise, if this has a lot of error, you multiply it with a large error, you, you suddenly multiply that too. What I'm trying to say is um, for instance, let's say the measurement x is x let's say, plus some error, okay? Or xe, let's say, is the error in the measurement. So if you come here, suddenly you don't have k times x anymore. You have k times x plus the x error, you see? So you're basically multiplying kx plus k times xe. So if xe is the measurement error, so suddenly you have a very large multiplication of the error into the system. And there's always going to be an error in your measurement. So you don't want the k to be very large. If k is very large, then you multiply, then a large number, an error, erroneous number will go into the system. So you don't want that. But at the same time, if k is a very large number, k times x will become a very large number over here. And the input shouldn't be very large either because the elevator or the ailerons, they all have limits, right? So how do you choose the desired eigenvalues, right? How do you choose the desired eigenvalues? I always give you in the problem, let's set it here. But how are you going to choose it? So there are a few issues here. First of all, what if I have more controls and more states? So if I don't have a unique solution, how do I balance things? 
The second problem is, how do I look at this, right? How do I make sure that the desired eigenvalue is not too far away, but not too close either, okay? So that's a balance. How do I make sure that the desired eigenvalue doesn't saturate you, in other words, doesn't make you very large, okay? So there is some sort of an optimization happening here, and that is a little different from saying, let's put the eigenvalues to a certain point, okay? And this is what this new topic is about. Optimal control is basically about balancing things out and writing things as an optimization problem and then choosing K based on that optimization, not based on someone telling you put the eigenvalues here and there, okay? At the end of the day, we will still be calculating the feedback gain K. We are not doing anything different. We are still calculating a feedback gain K. It's just that the calculation of K will be a result of an optimization problem. And the optimization problem will try to solve all these issues that I just mentioned to you. Okay? Now the question is, of course, what, how do we optimize things? Well, optimization is basically trying to find the minimum or a maximum of a function. Okay? This is, it, we are trying to talk about it in that sense here. Okay? And the simplest optimization problem you probably had was if you had a two-dimensional problem. Okay. Let's say you have a function and that is x and the function looks like this. And let's find the minimum of this function. So that would be the minimum. And sometimes finding the minimum of functions gives you the optimum situation. Okay? And this is what we are trying to do here. What I'm going to do is we are trying to, we will not set desired eigenvalues anymore. We will, we will define a function. Okay, we will define a function and we will try to optimize that function by finding the, minim, the, the, the minimum value of that function. And that minimum value will hopefully give us the best k possible. Okay, so this is what we mean, I mean, in a broad sense, this is what we mean by optimal control. We are trying to optimize things a little bit here, not make it too large, not make it too little and still try to make sure that the, um, the steady state value is where it's supposed to be and things like this. So let me show you what that optimization would look like. So here's my proposition to you. Let's define, define the following function. Here, I, I just define the function, so I, I'm just proposing this, right? Let's define the following function. It looks complicated, but it's not, believe me. S F G R different functions. T F is final time. Control. 
little definition here. Then we can talk about this. That it's a positive definite functions. Ah, oh, not functions, matrices, sorry. Matrices. Definite. Said positive definite matrices, and here's a definition for positive definite matrix. So I will, I mean, it looks a little, it looks very different from what we have done from the beginning of this class, but believe me, it is not as, as, complicated as it looks. Okay? So, and J is my function. J is a function. It's my, what we call, let me put it maybe here. J is what we call the cost function. Cost function. And we would like to minimize this function. Minimize, minimize J. That's the goal. Okay? We would like to minimize J. Okay. All right. So, so now we can. Now we have to talk about this a little bit. And this is still for this situation. Plus B U X. K plus minus U R. Okay, still that. D is X desired. Maybe that's something you want to write here as well. XD is desired. Desired state. Okay, to write it down. All right, so let me, let me uh, try to explain what's happening here, okay? Let's start with a definition. Let's start with this. I define something called a positive definite matrix. A positive definite matrix A is if x transpose times A times x is always greater than zero for all x's that are not equal to zero. If x is equal to zero, of course, this becomes equal to zero, right? But if x is not equal to zero, then x transpose times a times x is greater than zero. If this is true, then a is a positive definite matrix. No. Now, what, what does it mean? x is something like that, right? x1, x2, let's say xn, all right? So x transpose would look like this, x1, x2, xn, right? So what does this mean? x transpose times a times x, it would look like this. x1, x2, xn, you would have a matrix A, and then you would have x1, x2, 
xn, right? So multiply this with that, what will you get from this? Will you get a matrix or would you get a vector? You will get a vector, right? You will get a vector and it will look like this. I don't know, some y1, y2, yn, I don't know, something like that, right? And then you multiply with this, with that, what do you get? A number, right? You will get a number, let's call this z. You will get a number z, okay? And if this number z, is it positive or negative? If it's always positive, then A, I would call a positive definite matrix, okay? Now, what does this look like? It looks like this, look at this. It looks like A x t times A times x. If this was a scalar, if this was a scale, if x was not a vector but a scalar, so it would be x times a times x. If x was a scalar, a is a scalar number, right? So you would have something like a times x square. And x square is always positive, of course. And if a is also positive, then the result will always be positive. And this is very similar to this one. You have something like, it is very similar to having x times x. It's very similar to have something like x square. In fact, if this was an identity, identity times x, what would you have if this was an identity? You would have x times x, right? Or let's do this, x times x, x transpose times x. What do you have? You have x1, x2, xn. You will have x1, x2, xn, right? Well, what would you have? You would have x1 squared plus x2 squared plus xn squared, and this would be a number, and it would be uh, squares, uh, 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 an addition of squares, which would always be greater than zero, except if they're all zero, it will be, of course, equal to zero, but if they're not equal to zero, then this will always be greater than zero, because it is squares of, uh, additions of squares. Do you see that? So. And if you multiply this with a matrix and you get still everything positive, this is almost like multiplying a square with a positive number. So I can't tell you that the A matrix is positive because there are lots of numbers in there. All I can tell you is that A is positive definite, which means that it is some sort of a matrix that acts in this problem as if it was a positive number. Right? It's not really a number, it's a matrix, but very similar to this. Multiply x with x and with a number, you have x squared times a and it's positive, okay? And here you're doing a very similar thing, x transpose times x, multiply this with that, and it is a positive, uh, uh, the, the addition of squares. So I'm putting a matrix in between this, and I say if this is always positive, then a is almost like a positive number but we call it positive definite, okay? And usually if A is all a positive number, you know, if, if everything in A, all numbers in A are positive, then this would naturally become also greater than zero. But that's not, it doesn't have to be always positive. Sometimes, you know, a, 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 um, a certain combination of numbers would still give you a positive number. So. Uh, a, if everything is positive, A is positive, this will become positive, of course. So this is what we mean by A, a positive definite number. You understand that? And xt, A times x will always give you a number. Okay, let's, let's agree with that. So if you look at this part of the matrix, xt times f times x, what is that? If f is a positive definite number, right? This is always a positive number. I mean, this is not a matrix anymore. A, ma a vector, matrix vector, this will be a number, right? Won't that be a number? X, T, F, X will uh, be a number, right? Like this, vector, matrix, vector, Multiplying this with this will give you a vector. Multiply this vector with this vector, you will get a number, okay? So what you're having here is really 
getting a, an integral of a number from t0, the initial starting point in time, to the final starting point. Okay? So if I had a problem that looked like this, time in x, start x, let's say it's 0. I'm just making this up now. And you are doing this. Okay? So the start of your problem can be here. And let's say this is the end of my problem, t final. So what we are going to do is we are going to multiply, we are going to look at x t f x, and we are going to add all these numbers from t zero to two t final as time goes by. And x by itself, it is the square of the of the, of the states along this way. Okay, so this is that part. Look at the second part. The second part is a very similar, and that looks at the control. It looks at the control. So u t g times u, let's call this x z1 if you want to. This is also always a positive number. Okay? Regardless if u or x is negative, you know, x could be negative, but it will still be positive if f is positive definite. I mean, look, look here. If x1 is a negative number or x2 is a negative number, it doesn't matter. You're taking the square of it. It will always be positive. Okay? So when will xt x be large? This will be large if the magnitude of x1 is large. Right? I mean, it doesn't matter if it's a negative number or a positive number. You're taking the square. This number, this will become large if x1 the magnitude is a large number, right? If, if x2 is a large number, then this will become a large number. It will not be an, a large number if x2 is, is negative. It has nothing to do with it, right? Even if you had a minus sign over here, it doesn't matter because you're taking the squares. So they will always be, this will be very large if you have large magnitudes. The direction really doesn't matter here. So this is that. This is basically, if x was a scalar, it is almost like this, f times x squared, right? If x was a scalar, it would be x f x, and that would be equal to f x squared. So if this was a scalar, it, was, it would be f times x squared. And this would be g times u square. So if this all was a scalar, it would look like this, from t0 to t final, take f x square plus g times u square. And take the time derivative from time t0 to tf. Do you understand what this is, first of all? I'm, I'm going to tr try to explain you why we are doing this in a minute. But you first have to understand what we are doing. We are taking the squares of the states as the states go from the initial to the final state. Let's say you do a maneuver with your airplane. You start the maneuver at t0, you do a maneuver, and finish the maneuver, that would be t final. What you're doing is you're adding this, the states, the squares of the states, and the squares of the controls with some positive definite numbers or positive definite matrices and you add them all together from the beginning of the state to the end of the state like taking an integral. At each time instant you're adding them together. So basically taking an integral. You're adding those little squares of states and controls on top of each other. Okay? Now This is that part. So this part, let's remove it for a second. Let's, I, I'm going to explain it in a minute. But let's simplify the problem for a second. And say, let's look at as a simpler, simplify, simplify. OK. Let's look at this problem only. T0, T final.
Let's look at this problem only. So I remove the other part. If I would tell you that let's define a function j that just adds the squares of the axis with some matrix F. Let's add the squares of the controls with a matrix G and add them together. Take the integral as, a, as time goes from T0 to Tf. Taking the integral is adding them on top of each other, right? I mean, let's say this is x <coughs> and this is time. Let's say this is your x. And let's say you have time and you have x square and it will look like this, okay? So what does it mean to take the, the, the integral? It basically means add everything together and multiply it with f as time goes by. And if this is t final, you're basically just adding what's underneath here all on top of each other if this is x squared. And you can even say this is f times x squared. And f is just a number if it's a scalar, but here f is a matrix, and it is very similar to having a positive number if it was a scalar. Here you have a positive definite matrix. Okay, so if this was a scalar, it would look like this, just to explain it to you. If x is one state, okay, and u is one control, then the problem actually looks like this. I have a one over two over here, sorry. One over two. T final, T zero, uh, it would be x f times x plus u g times u times d t and j would be equal to 1 over 2 t f t 0 f x square plus g u square plus d t. Okay? So x is a scalar here and u is a scalar scalar variable. Let me just not write this. I mean, x, u, f, and g are scalar numbers, okay? Because x is one state and u is one control, so there's no, there's no uh, vector. If that's the case, then it will look like this, f times x squared, g times u squared, okay? So you basically add the square of x, multiply it with a number f, Take the square of u, multiply it with the number g, okay? And then take the integral from t final, uh, from t0 to t final. But this is wrong, of course. Why don't you tell me? Start from, that's, that's okay, right? From t0 to t final. From t0 to t final. Okay? So take the squares of u and take from 0 to tf. So if I had, maybe this is, a better way to start to explain this. Let's say this is the control. And let's say this is x. And x will look like that. Okay? So you're taking the square of x, multiply it with f. Take the square of u, multiply with g. This is the case when x and u is only one number. If x and u is not a number but as a vector, then the problem would look like this. It is essentially the same problem. And this problem is the same. This plus this part, I, I will explain you in a minute. Let's concentrate on this part first, okay? And maybe it is simple to look at only one state and one control, and it's over here, okay? So let's look at this part first. So if I would tell you that I would like to minimize, I would like to minimize J, okay? If I would like to minimize j, what does it mean? If I would tell you I would like to minimize j for this problem, what would it mean for x and u? 
given that f and g are fixed. They are fixed numbers. The variables are x and u, and I would like to minimize j. What does it mean? What does it mean to the problem? What happens to x? Does x move a lot or does it move little? Or how can I minimize j here? For example, or in what problem would j be small? In what problem would j be large? It's actually very simple. If during that maneuver u moves a lot, then j will be large, isn't it? If x moves a lot, then j will be large. Oh, let me give you two examples then. Let's say I have two problems, x, t, u, t, and let me put another one, x, t, u, t. So this is problem one, and this is problem two. And let's say this is t final, that's t final, and that's t final, and that's t final. Which one would have a larger j? This one or this one? The first one. Why? Because we are going to add this x <laughs> square and then we're going to add this, x squared, and this, and this, as a function of time, we're going to take the integral of this. So as long as these are large numbers, this will become large. Large numbers here will become large because we are going to add the squares of them on top of each other, okay? On this side, because these are small, so therefore j will be small, okay? So the minute I tell you, I want to have j small, which immediately means that controls are not moving too much and the states are not moving too much. That's what this immediately means when I say let's make j small. It means don't move x too much, don't move u too much. Okay? Otherwise if you move u and x too much you will have large numbers and j will become large. Okay? So, so the first thing I, in my controls problem, in my, in my closed loop controls problems, what I always try to do is I try to move x not too much, right? We are, <coughs> <coughs> we are trying to, we don't like this, kind of always like this. Which one would have a larger J, the blue one or the red one? The red one, right? Because you are not moving too much. You just have this nice thing. The red one would have all these large movements. So the first part of the problem here tries to not move x and u too much. That's what it's trying to do. If I minimize j, then what I'm really trying to do is I will try x and try to not move x and u too much. I will try to move them as little as possible. Okay? And here is the same. If you minimize j, you will try to not move x and u too much. Move x and u as little as possible. That's what it means, if I want to minimize j. Okay, minimize j. So this part of the problem, if I minimize j, is trying x and u not to move too much. Okay, this is that. Here, this part of the problem, it looks at a desired x at final time, and this is x at final time. 
So x minus xt is basically an error in final time where I want to take x, but x is not there. Okay, so this is where I want to take x, and this is where x is actually moving. So the difference is an error. Okay? It's like a steady state error. This is E transpose. Transpose, transpose. Times S. It's the same thing. X transpose, uh, X final, XD final. So this is still the error desired to X. So it is the same thing, except it is not an integral because it's only looking at a number in finite time, uh, uh, at the final condition. So it looks at the steady state error at the very end, at t final. And that's one number. I mean, it is not an integral. Okay? And it is the same thing. If this is a positive definite matrix, you are taking the square. Ideally, this should be equal to that, if there's no steady state error. And this will be equal to 0. If, this, if, if the steady state error is equal to 0, then this part would be equal to 0, because errors would be equal to 0. But if there is a steady state error, then these are not equal to 0, and you still have an error. OK, so the larger the error, the bigger j. OK, so j, if I say I minimize j in a problem, it means three things now. One, move x as little as possible. Two, move the controls as little as possible. Three, make sure at the end we are where we are supposed to be, which means we go to the desired point. No steady state error. So if I minimize j, I have two, three things happening. One, I go to the right steady state. No steady state error. I go to my desired point. OK? That's the number one. Second condition, go there, but don't move the states too much. Don't move the states too much, and don't move the controls too much. So if I minimize this, I'm killing, bird, I'm killing a few birds with one stone, which means I still go to the steady state with as little error as possible. I'm not moving my controls too much, and I'm not moving the states too much. So what does this correspond to? It corresponds to this situation, to this point here. corresponds to this. I'm just going <coughs> to plot this in one dimension now. Let's say this is your x desired. And you want to go to that x desired, right? You can go to this x desired in a number of ways, one of which is this. This is one way of going to x desired. Another way of going to x desired is this. OK. You look at u and t. And for the blue one, u might look like this. And for the red one, u might just look like this. So which one would you prefer as a controls person? You would prefer probably the red one, where you go to the desired steady state without moving too much. Controls are not moving too much. The elevator is moving a little. And you go to the steady state without having a large error. But you could go to the steady state with large controls. OK? and moving the airplane too much, and you would still go to the same steady state, no problem. The problem is you have moved too much, and the controls were moving like crazy. And you don't want that. You want little movement, little movement, but still go to the steady state. And if you minimize j, this is exactly what it is promising. It promises minimum of j will correspond to a minimum movement of x Minimum movement of u and minimum error in the steady state. <coughs> you add them together, that's j. If 
you minimize j, you minimize all three at the same time. You understand that? So you might ask, then, what is f, g, and s? These are like weight matrices, like weighing matrices. Because you might say, which one is more important? Is it more important to move you, or move, uh, move you less, or move x less, or which one is more important? If the steady state error is super important, make s a large number, g and f small numbers, then in the optimization problem, any error will be multiplied with a large matrix, and therefore this will become a large number, so the error will become more important over here. Here on this side, if you say the movement of x, I don't want x to move a lot, it's very important that x does not move, then make f large, and a small movement in x will be multiplied with a large number, and, and it will dominate the whole optimization problem. So movements in u and error here will become small numbers, and f, this will become a large number, and therefore if you add this one with this one, a small movement in x will turn into a large number in j. So the emphasis on the problem will be to minimize x if f is a large number. If you do it the other way, if you make j, g large and f and s small, then it means a small movement in u will become a large number and therefore it will dominate the problem. For instance, this will become 100, this will become only 1, right? So a small movement in u will end up in a large number in j and therefore if you want to put more emphasis on u, telling that u should not move too much, then you can make g very large. So you can now balance out which one is more important to you. Do you want more control in U? The movement in U, is that more important? Is the movement in X more important? Or is the steady state more important? Choose the one you like and make that number large. And it will dominate the problem and if you minimize J, that part will be, uh, will be according to what you desire but then you will let the other ones loose. Let me put it, let me give you an example. What I'm trying to say is that. If you say, for instance, let me give you an example. Let's say it is very important that the steady state error is equal to zero or close to zero. And it's very important that x doesn't move too much. Okay? You, well, you can move you. I have a lot of controls, that's fine. Okay? So, what you might have at the end is a problem that looks like this. Let's say this is your x desired. So you might be doing this. No movement, perfect steady state, everything is, looks really good. But then you look at u and you left u, you left u free, basically u can be whatever it is, and u does this. Okay? So it's working very hard to do it happen, to make this happen. It works very hard to make this happen. Okay? If you want to have this situation, you could achieve this by saying x by f is large, s is large, u, g, don't care. Okay? It, you can be very large, g can be small. You might have the opposite situation. You might say, let's do the opposite. I want you not to move too much, the control, not to move too much. So the control U moves very little. And I don't care, X can move a lot and the steady state error not so important. In that case, you might have something like that. And you might indeed move a lot and have a steady state error at the end. But you didn't move too much. So you are basically balancing things out. 
Either you move a lot with your controls, you work very hard and make sure that X doesn't move too much and you still don't have a steady state error, which means the control has to do a lot of work. Or you can say the U, um, the U does work a lot. Uh, I mean, either the, the, the control moves a lot and does a lot of work and you have good performance, or you say the performance is not so good, you're moving a lot and the steady state error is not there, but U is moving little. So you can balance this out, okay? Because the ideal case would be that U not moving too much, X not moving too much, but going to the steady state in a nice way, right? That would be the ideal case. But that doesn't always happen. Sometimes in order to have the good performance, not moving too much, going to the steady state, will require that U also moves a lot. The question now is, do you have a lot of control authority to move? Okay, so this is, this problem that I just put on the board turned out to be a very nice problem to solve for optimization people. Okay, you might say, okay, so now where is K here? Okay, we will put it into the K in a minute. All right, K will come in, into the picture in a minute. But the goal here is to minimize J such that I don't have a steady state error, X is small and U doesn't move too much. Okay, that is your optimization problem. So if I optimize, if I minimize J, I know I've found a, a case where this happens. So the goal will be to minimize J, but I have to put um, the, uh, the, 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 the feedback gain, um, uh, the K, I need to put it uh, into the picture in a minute. Do you understand the problem? I'm not expecting you how to find K or anything. Just understand this problem and what this means here. Do you understand that? So let me give you give a short break. And I'll be here and you can ask me questions. Okay? So let's give a break.